Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Cool. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Leontine Talbo. I'm the technical analyst at Cambridge University Libraries in the digital preservation team. And today I will be talking about a new service that we set up, which is called the transfer service. Um, and yeah, we're, we're like at the start of everything. So everything here is very new to me um, and I'm hoping to learn quite a lot across the next two days. Um, so yeah, just a bit of background before I go into a bit more detail. Um, so we've been running a transfer service since February 2023. So it's only been up for a few months um, and we focus on digital carriers. So we're looking at um, optical discs, floppy disks, um, that, that type of material. Um, we've done over 300 processes now and they are mainly optical discs. So about two, 250 of them are CDs or DVDs. Um, we use a thread. This is our thread. Um, it stands for a forensic uh, re recovery evidence device. Um, it came to the library on a previous project and we're just really happy to have it. Um, it also includes a five and a quarter inch floppy drive, which is really handy. Um, and um, today in my presentation, I will be mainly talking about the things that we do slightly different than other um, institutions because m our main workflows and our equipment that we use are used across the community. Um, so we'll not be focusing on them in detail, but if you want to come and talk to me about that, uh, feel more than welcome. Um, the one thing that I do want to point out is that we um, mainly do logical file transfers instead of disk images. Um, what I mean by that is, just for the people who don't know, logical file transfers is basically copy and, copy and pasting the files from uh, whatever digital carrier comes in. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's basically what it comes down to. Um, whereas a disk image, as most of you will know, uh, is a bit by bit copy of, of that specific disk or specific digital carrier. We've mainly gone for this uh, approach because the carriers that come into the library um, are the digital carrier itself is not of as much of an importance. So it's just seen as like a carrier for that specific content. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the main reasons why we've gone for it. And then secondly, we um, within a very short time span have to make this material accessible, which means that with a disk image, you add another a part to the workflow. Um, this does not mean that we don't make disk images. We just have a preference for a logical file transfer. Um, if, if, for example, a hard drive comes in from um, an important author or a an, an different important person, we will still opt for a disk image. Um, so yeah, I will be talking through three topics. Um, uh, one around training, one around the documentation that we keep on these transfers and um, one on the collab collaborations that we've been doing with other institutions. Um, so yeah, just to start off with training, um, we have done a um, whole bunch of work around the guidance um, for staff members at Cambridge University Library. Um, and that is of importance to us because um, we have um, we use archive space within our library um, to basically keep records of all the all the material that we have, um, and when we surveyed archive space for digital carriers or digital material, uh, what came out was that um, a lot of staff members may have identified that there's digital carriers or digital material within the library, but they don't specify specifically what that is. So in a lot of cases it will say, oh, there's free, there's free digital carriers in this collection. But for us, it's really important to know if they are floppy disks or if they are optical disks or if they're a hard drive, because all of those need a different workflow. Um, so we've done quite a lot of work with um, the staff around um, writing guidance and updating archive space to make it possible for them to give us more information so that we can prioritize what carriers should go first and what carriers we may have to do more research into before we can process them. Um, this is an example. I'm sorry, I get that the type's very small, but on the left-hand side, you can see 
um, an assessment record within archive space. So we asked them for a bit more detail on stuff. Um, basically, we asked them to, to, if they have any idea, to give us an idea of like what's on that specific carrier. Um, and on the right, you can see one of our, um, uh, part of our identifying digital carriers guidance. Um, and this specifically is about three and a half inch floppy disks. Um, and we basically write down what we want them to uh, basically put in these nodes. So uh, for us, for example, it's really handy to know if it's a double density or a high density floppy disk, um, that, that type of stuff. So, um, and it's been really helpful and like everyone's been really good. All the staff has been really uh, good at making these notes, um, which makes our job a lot easier. Um, then we've got one that we've recently been working on, which is the transfer service guide. Um, and this one um, is basically outlines all the workflows and all the different equipment that we specifically use. Um, it is written specifically for the university library, um, but it has a wider audience in mind. Um, so I have highlighted all the parts that are specific to us um, and may not be relevant to other institutions. Um, it's split into three sections, which goes into detail on the pre-transfer. So that also includes like what type of virus scanning or that type of stuff that we do. Um, the transfer itself, um, so what equipment we use, what software we use, um, that type of stuff. And there's also a part on troubleshooting. So what do you do if the equipment doesn't work? Or what do you do if the digital carrier doesn't read? Um, so yeah, that, that's now finally written, which I'm really happy about. Um, and the idea is, is that staff can work through this guide themselves. So they can just follow it step by step, and basically do a transfer. Um, so yeah, we've had one staff member come and test it, and they were positive about it, so <laughs> that's good. Um, so yeah, um, another thing that we've been working on is um, documentation of um, of the processes and the digital carriers that come into the library. We have been extensively documenting this to a point where maybe at a at a future point we will decide not to keep all this information because it's quite a lot. Um, but basically, this is an overview of, we've recently gone from a spreadsheet to a database, which I'm very excited about. Um, but basically, uh, we, do we document a lot. So we don't only document that, for example, an optical disk comes in, but we also uh, document what type of format that optical disk is, what brand it's from, what color the reflective layer is, uh, is there any writing on the carrier, um, and the same for the processes. So we go into a lot of detail on like uh, what specific equipment did we use, what environment, what version of a software, um, just, just to see if we can say anything about the failure rate that we have in, in the library. Um, because that's the next thing. Um, our failure rate is quite high, higher than we were expecting when we started um, doing this work. So this uh, table is specifically from the first collection that I've been working on, which is supplemental material that came in with CCs uh, within the library. Um, and as you can see, the failure or the success rate is 87%. So we've got 13% of optical disks with uh, problems. What I do have to say here is that uh, we split it into three parts. So normally with disk images, you can either say it's a failure or it's 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 a, a success. Um, but with the with the logical file transfers, we've been able to um, maybe take a, p a partial part of like the data from from these disks, but not all of it. Um, so our partial success rates quite quite are quite, partial failure rate is quite high. Um, and I should also point out here that for flash storage and for flash storage, it seems that we're not very good at flash storage, but there were only four of them in the collection at the time. And the floppy disks, there's only three. So it seems that we're really good at floppy disks, but there's only three of them. Um, but basically, um, yeah, we were quite surprised by that high failure rate, but because we kept quite a lot of documentation on all of these disks, we could have a like, uh, we had a bit of an analysis of this material. Um, so the first one that we looked at was the age of the carrier. 
So I was assuming the older the carrier, the higher the failure rate. However, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case necessarily for us. Everything before 2000, fine, no problems. Everything between 2000 and 2005, and especially 2003, really problematic. Um, as you can also see, 2003 is the year that we have the most disks from, but also the highest failure rate. About 50% of those disks were, were problematic uh, in some way or another. Another thing that I should point out here as well is that um, there's quite a diverse range of disks in that, in that first collection as well. So it's not necessarily that it's one specific brand that keeps failing. It's just that specific year seems to have a lot of problems. Um, I looked into this in a bit more detail and uh, came across a report from the Canadian government that was talking about this. And they basically say, they were talking about that this was the period when um, disks were at their most use, basically. They were the most popular, like at their most popular peak, um, which meant that a lot of disks were produced, which also means that the quality may not be as, uh, as good as in uh, other years. Um, we also looked at carrier type, because um, I find some sources talking about that DVDs um, are better <laughs> than CDs. Um, not really the case for us. Um, CDs still have a slightly higher failure rate, but not significantly. Um, so yeah, one that is of interest is the brand of the carrier. Uh, so we noted this down as well. And the ones that have an unknown brand, I hope it's actually readable, but the bottom ones, the unknown brands, um, have a huge failure rate compared to the ones that have a brand on them, which again feeds into that kind of idea of like uh, the unbranded discs from the early 2000s that have like a lot of, um, that, that were used quite a lot in that time se seem to be the ones that, that fail. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting um, to be able to say something about that. So for now, we're going to keep documenting all that extra information um, to be able to say more about our uh, collection. Um, so the final section that I'm going to talk about is uh, collaboration. So we've been doing a number of collaborations with other institutions, um, and uh, one of them being the Churchill Archive Centre, which is also based in Cambridge. Um, they have their own digital archivist and their own basic, their own digital carriers. Um, at the time, we had the equipment to be able to uh, transfer uh, floppy disks, but hadn't identified them in our own collection yet. However, it was the other way around for the Churchill Archive Center, where they had floppy disks, but didn't have the equipment to actually transfer anything from them. So we decided to work together and were able to set up a workflow um, for these specific disks, which we're really happy about. Um, and a really interesting thing that we came across was that the, um, the software that we used, and I, I'd say some people in this room are familiar with it as the FC5025, and the disk image and browse software that comes with it. Um, it was written by an American company, and which is normally not really a problem, um, but we really realized that it was a problem for us because um, at that time, IBM didn't have a huge market share in the UK, which meant that um, a lot of the disks that we had were from quite obscure formats that this software didn't recognize. Um, which is really interesting because when you read like the guidance around this material, um, they basically say, oh, it's quite easy, most formats will be picked up. Um, but apparently the UK liked having interesting formats um, and we had a hard time actually reading anything from them. In the end, we were able to set up a workflow for these as well. Um, but yeah, it meant a bit more troubleshooting and a being a bit more difficult than we first anticipated it to be. Um, Something that we've recently done, which I'm really excited about, is um, work with our digital content unit. So we've got a digital content unit at Cambridge University Library, and basically they look at, um, they digitize material from across the library. But they also have some really cool scientific equipment that they use for this. Um, 
and two of them um, we were allowed to use. Um, one of them being a microscope, which I will go into a bit more detail in a sec. Um, but also multispectral imaging, which is basically a machine that takes a picture all across the color spectrum. So ultraviolet and infrareds there as well, like colors that we can't see as humans. Um, and it produces this really lovely graph. Um, aside from making really nice pictures of carriers, um, we were actually really interested to see if we would be able to say stuff about um, a bunch of carriers that we have in our collection that fail, but we're not able to see any damage on them. So some of them are really obvious that they will, f or that they have failed because there's like huge uh, scratches on them or something else really obvious. Um, but we also have a whole bunch of them in our collection that we don't really know why they fail. Um, and we were thinking maybe with the help of the digital content unit, we would be able to say more about these, um, these carriers. And I've got two examples actually. Um, one of them being this disc on the left, which does actually have severe damage, but I was actually convinced that it was like kind of like paper just stuck to the CD and that for some reason you could maybe get rid of this paper um, with some extensive cleaning. We also have a conservation department at Cambridge University Library and they've been helping out uh, quite a bit with cleaning some less damaged discs, um, but we just wanted to see if if how damaged this disc actually was before before cleaning it. And actually, um, as you can see on the right, um, it's the glue or whatever substance underneath that paper has been eating into the actual plastic. So even if we were able to get rid of that paper, it is severely damaged, which is really sad. Um, but yeah, it's really nice to, to actually know that instead of going through all the uh, processing and all the resources to try and clean this disc and then to find out it's actually too severely damaged. Um, another one that's really interesting, we've got a number of final wrapped CDs also from 2003. I don't know why anyone thought that this was a good idea, um, <laughs> but we have, we've got about 20 of them. Um, and one of them are these, there's, there's uh, four of these. Um, and they're wrapped with this non-reflective black vinyl, which basically makes them look like black voids. If you hold them up as well, you know normally how you can see burn marks on, on CDs? You can't see anything on these. So we were able to read one of them, but not the other three. And it made me wonder, is there actually any data on these on these other three discs that are not reading? Because you literally can't see anything on them. Um, but with the multispectral imaging, the digital content unit was able to show that there is something on that, which you can see on the right, like it does reflect um, under, under a certain uh, setting. Um, so yeah, it doesn't solve our problem. We're still not able to read them, but at least we can say now that there is data on them. There's, some, there's something there. Um, so yeah. Um, just to go through a few next steps of stuff that we're going to be up to in the next few months. Um, we have a Mac computer, which I'm very excited about. Um, we have had a real problem reading anything that's Mac formatted. It can make a disk image, but it doesn't really make the files accessible to us in, at, at this point. Um, but now we have a Mac computer, so I'm hoping that that will solve some of those issues. Um, we've got quite a lot of new donated equipment. Um, so we have at the University and Information Services, um, which donated a bunch of equipment to us, which we're very happy about, um, which we're happy to go and test. There's some like data tapes, but there's also um, a computer with an internal three and a half inch floppy disk and a five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Um, and especi I'm especially excited about the three and a half inch floppy disk, which is internal, because it may be able to read double density ones, but we shall see. Um, another thing that we're going to be setting up is an audio workflow. So we've identified one mini disk in our collection, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, but we're also going to be looking at LP and cassettes in that same workflow. Um, 
we will be continuing training staff members around using this equipment because um, it would be nice if I'm not the only one that knows how Fred works. Um, and then we're, or I'm, that's that's a maybe a bit selfish, but I would love to do some more collaborations uh, with with other institutions um, about fl digital carriers. Um, so yeah, that's me. Are there any questions? Thank you for that lovely presentation. <laughs> um, one question, does it make a difference or did you experience differences when you use um, different CD, um, I don't know the English term, CD reading units, you know, that you... Drives. It drives, yeah. yeah. So at the moment we only have one drive in, f in FRED, um, but the new equipment that we got donated has another driver in it, so I'm really hoping to do the ones that basically failed and see if there's a difference. Because um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there is. Um, from reading blogs and everything online, it seems like there, there, there could be a difference. Um, but yeah, at the moment we only have one drive, so I'm not, I'm not able to, to say. <laughs> Um, could you just broadly paint a picture of what is on the drives that you recover? Oh yeah, okay, I like that. Um, I like that question. So it's like from our collection, um, or like from Cambridge University Library collection. So um, some of the material comes in with uh, students that have done work, um, PhD students. Um, so that's basically their <coughs> supplemental material that comes with their, their work. Um, and that can range from like, um, can just be a spreadsheet or a database, but there's even one that has a pair of 3D glasses with it, because it's like a 3D model, which is very cool. Um, and then we've got like collections that um, are from like the university archives, so it's just like documents from the university itself. Um, there's stuff that comes in from the uni university archive press, which is also very interesting. And the collection that I'm currently working on is Stephen Hawking's personal archive, um, which includes, which does include five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Um, and all that material um, is either like presentations from him and like earlier versions of his speech software, which is very cool. So it's a whole wide range of stuff, which is very, very exciting. Uh, with regard to uh, the damaged surface of the CDs or DVDs, have you ever tried to polish them? I'm, I, I think there is some ways to polish CDs or DVDs, yeah. but I've never heard anything how successful that procedure is. So when you look it up online, there's people who like talk about the weirdest stuff to use for it. So. Uh, Apparently, toothpaste works, but we're not going to be using that on our personal collections. Um, we do know, we were talking to the National Archives, and apparently they have a polishing machine. Um, so it's something that we want to look into um, in the future. Um, we have had a few of the discs cleaned by conservation. So we've been really lucky with our conservation department that one of the conservative conservators um, has experience with these types of discs so she's cleaned a few of them and actually we've been able to recover material from one of them which is great um, and that's just a, a basic cleaning of them but yeah um, I would love to try the polishing um, but yeah we, ha we have to be careful because like it's collection material so probably you only get one go at it so maybe only for the ones that are really no other way to save them. Um, so yeah. <coughs> um, hi, this uh, question is coming from a remote participant. Um, do you work with copy protected material and does it pose problems? Copy protected material as in copyright protected material? Maybe, shall we just? Oh yeah, the commercial ones that have, yeah. So um, 
I have been able to, we've ha we had two commercial CDs come in in that, in that way. One of them through the supplemental material stuff and one of them through Cambridge University Press, which, we've, which I've both made a copy of. But I think the co copy protected material, so if not technically have not had a problem recovering material from these discs, um, but I can imagine that it may pose um, questions or other problems around like copyright and making that accessible to users. Um, but we're not we're not at that step yet. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. <laughs> I have three short questions. One is um, for the Mac formatted disks. Have you tried the Linux disk tools? I've had so yes. Um, and we've had, I've had success with the three and a half inch floppy disks that we had um, and have been able to recover the material from those. Um, however, there's a few disks, optical disks, that I think are Mac formatted but are not showing up in any of the software, but they do have Mac written on them, are like ma formatted for Mac. I don't know what's wrong with those. I'm hoping that with the Mac computer, they may be able to read, but yeah, it's a mystery. There's there's about four or five of them. Okay, because I was talking about the floppies mainly, but... Um. Oh, yeah, yeah, so the floppies, yes. Good. The optical disks, no. Okay. <laughs> the, um, uh, are you reading the images before you extract the files, or do you copy the files directly? Oh, we copy them directly. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh. <laughs> and the third thing is for the black discs, have you tried a PlayStation to read them? No. Okay. Oh, well, what PlayStation specifically, or does it not matter? No, I honestly don't know. I just, I honestly don't know, but I can ask a friend of mine. I just know that PlayStation also had these black discs. They just look the same. I'm not oh, sure if they're identical, really cool. and their drives are basically optimized for reading the black discs. Yeah, because that I'm would be. I'm pretty sure you can hack a PlayStation to basically run software on it. Because like that would be the earlier PlayStations, right? Because if it's sorry, maybe we should continue this conversation now. But it would be probably PlayStation Two. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I like that idea actually. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have time for maybe two more questions, one or two. Anyone else? You? Okay. Thank you. Um, because you mentioned uh, Steve Hawkins' um, speech software, uh, how do you deal with proprietary um, files? You come and come, you can copy them, but you can't open them because the software is outdated. And I'm not. Yeah. So yeah, we have that problem with those disks. Um, what we're probably looking into, the f my, my first thing that we will probably look into is emulation. Um, but again, that poses a lot of questions because that is not necessarily making it, e like access at scale is very diff difficult if you, if you use emulation. Um, but it will make it possible for the um, archivists to at least have a look at the files and appraise them and see what they want to keep and what they want to get rid of. Um, so we, we, we will have to see, because migration could also be an option. But um, yeah, I don't know if that's possible for the ones that we saw on the floppy disk, because there's not really anything to migrate it to that will work. Um, so yeah, there's some of that material does open because they're text files or like other material, but like the actual software, uh, no, is specifically written for um, IBM, the older IBM computers. So yeah, we shall see. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, there's another question in the chat, or I'm gonna try and put two together. So. Um, the first is, um, I think that you mentioned that you use the FC5025 uh, software, and I wanted to know if you are also using their floppy controller hardware in your FRED. And then a follow-up on the FRED is, um, does it work seamlessly with newer hardware? Um, so, yes, that's the one that we use on the FRED, the FC5025. Um, uh, software, or like, it's a little chip that you put into an older um, uh, 
floppy drive, like five and a quarter inch floppy drive. And then it comes with a piece of software called Disk Image and Browse. So that's basically what we use for the five and a quarter inch uh, floppy disks. But then we have been seeing problems with the more obscure formats, um, which are not really readable with that piece of software because it's more based on um, IBM generated uh, formats. Um, second question was about newer, newer hardware. Yes, Fred's very good with new hardware. Um, however, it's the older stuff that's problematic. Um, so like you can't just like plug in an, an three and a half inch floppy disk without having the similar problems to other uh, computers. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's all we have time for. Let's give uh, Leontina uh, an applause.